Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you, Joyce and Corey and Allison. It's so encouraging to hear about um, these amazing efforts that are going on all over the country. Um, I think sometimes when you're sitting in your office alone, trying to get community programs running, you think that you're on an island and, and, and really um, or swimming, swimming against the tide. And it's awesome to hear how successfully you all are doing it um, and really encouraging. Um, so I'm going to speak about one very specific community effort that we recently launched. Um, it's also, um, it's a fascinating time to be discussing this topic, not only because the um, current criminal justice context that we're living in, um, but also because of last week and seeing trust as a predicate for the legitimacy of any government function, and that includes law enforcement and prosecution. Um, and we in Jackson County, we've, we've always believed that. We believe that our legitimacy um, is directly proportionate to our community trust. And so in recent years, I mean, probably starting 10 years ago, but then taking um, some really serious steps since at least 2016, when we received a federal smart prosecution grant, which is now called an Innovative Prosecution Solutions Grant. Um, that was kind of what gave, first gave us resources to, to really dedicate towards um, community outreach and community legitimacy. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to uh, first give you a quick overview about why we set up an advisory board. Um, many of those ideas you've already thrown out. And then two, I'm going to talk really practically about the steps and implications of our um, community advisory board. I, um, my, my, present, my PowerPoint presentation that I'll share is more related to the data that we shared with the board, um, just as an FYI. So, um, like I said, we, we have long seen the community as an actual partner, um, equal to the way that we see um, the police as a partner. And so over the years, we've done different outreach efforts, um, some of which have been mentioned here, but certainly not to the extent um, that, that some offices are doing. Uh, but we've assigned prosecutors to neighborhood associations, so prosecutors needed to attend neighborhood meetings. Um, we've done community events and various tangible outreach efforts, um, including some, some food drop-offs um, and certainly um, victim outreach efforts, which we also view as, as part of our community outreach. We don't have an individual community outreach unit. It happens, like I said, um, it sort of began growing out of our smart prosecution grant and now sort of happens, you know, alongside another grant that we have just received as, as that's tied up with our crime strategies unit. Um, but we also view it not to be, we, we don't want the community outreach to be um, separate from our core prosecutions. So that's also another reason why we haven't yet formed um, another unit. Um, so we were, we were engaged in community outreach, but we wanted community to have an actual seat at the table. We would say that rhetorically, we, a community should have a seat at the table. And then we said, okay, wait a minute. What if we actually got a table and sat down a community with it on, on a regular basis? Um, so in terms of impetus, um, it really began with us acknowledging our blind spots, um, we make an effort for diversity in the office and for diversity in hiring, but we're not wholly successful. We just don't have it. We don't have the perspective in our office of the people um, who live and work in our most violent areas and they're the people who are most affected by crime in Kansas City. Um, by the way, Kansas City is um, one of the top five most violent cities in the United States, particularly um, gun violence. And this year, as many cities, in 2020, we experience, experienced a historic high um, in, in homicides. So we're at um, a really low point here. Um, alongside that, um, our office um, has recently had to charge more use of force cases, including um, in 2020 charging an officer with manslaughter. So. Um, so our relationship with the police department started rapidly deteriorating 
Um, and so it became more even more important for us to um, reach out to community directly and not let police just mediate that relationship because police are obviously um, the front lines and, and that, that can't change. Um, but we saw a role for our office as well. Um, so we wanted, we wanted actual community input in a systemic way, not in a one-off way, in a, in a sort of systemized way um, to advise us on policy um, and to, to, to help us with, as I said, our blind spots. Um, so we started thinking about this in probably the summer of 2019. Um, but we, we didn't operationalize it until um, this last summer, summer of 2020 in July. Um, there were a couple of reasons for that. One um, was there are a lot of downsides to something like starting a community advisory board. Um, and I had a lot of concerns and was frankly the one dragging, dragging my feet um, and, and offering pushback against our, our elected Jean Peters Baker was a big fan of this. Um, my concerns were, one, we're going to upset people. Any board you put together, you're going to upset people by who was asked and who wasn't asked. And that's um, just people being personally offended or personally upset or also constituencies not being represented, right? Like, why didn't you get someone from this sector? Why didn't you get someone from this neighborhood? Like, we're humans, people are gonna be upset. Um, and so I was worried about making the community angry um, with our choice of a board. Um, and then I was also worried, you know, that anything you say can and will be used against you. So if we, if we kind of pull back the curtains, then, you know, in, in an earnest, good faith way, are we ultimately just giving ammunition for people um, to, uh, to, to use against us? So we were kind of, you know, balancing all of these things. And then um, George Floyd happened and the events of last spring, and it was immediately clear um, the risks did not matter. We were inviting the community in, we were pulling back the curtains, you know, whatever, whatever angst came our way, we were gonna, we were gonna take. Um, so, um, let me go to logistics real quick. We had asked people at a community event to volunteer. So we had a list of, of we, we had proposed this idea of a, of a, of a board. Um, and we, so we had a list of people who were interested, but we also from our previous community outreach efforts um, had a lot of good relationships in the community, which it sounds like many of you do as well. So we ended up choosing 12 individuals all of whom live or work in the urban core. So Kansas City or Jackson County, like, um, like your jurisdictions is large and you work with different law enforcement partners. Jackson County is actually very diverse in terms of we have an urban core, um, which has a majority black population. And then Jackson County extends all the way um, east, further into Missouri where it is rural, all white, um, you know, very, very different uh, public safety issues, very different role and presence of law enforcement. So we, we made a choice. Um, we were not putting together a diverse community advisory board. We were putting together a community advisory board uh, that was representative of the vast majority of cases we charge, which are from the urban core. So we chose 12 individuals. So that all of them live or work in the urban core. They are pastors, community organizers, neighborhood association presidents, um, a school board member, student leaders. Some of them are, um, are prominent and politically involved and the person that you would expect to be on a government advisory board. And some of them are not. Some of them are um, individuals. One, um, one is a formerly incarcerated individual um, who's turned his life around and um, has never sat on anything like a, a law enforcement advisory board. So we have both um, the expected and the unexpected. All of them, I mean, I, it should be assumed, were willing to work with us. Um, 
you know, if if you were we we were happy to have activists, but if you were the type of activist who believes that um, you know law enforcement shouldn't exist or prosecution shouldn't exist, that's a legitimate viewpoint. It's just not something that we can work with on this board. So um, we wanted different opinions. We wanted people who would push back against us, but um, it wasn't useful to have you know people who believed that we shouldn't exist, for instance. Um, did wasn't you have um, applicants? Do you know how, did you have a number of applicants or did you reach out and just select 12? We, in the end, we did have a number of applicants, but in the end, we reached out to people um, for the reason that I stated, we we had they had to be vetted in some sense. We had to know that they were that they were willing to work with or weren't hostile toward government or law enforcement entirely, but had but had ideas for um, reform. So, four, sorry, four minute warning. Five minute warning. Four. Yep. Okay. So we launched this in the middle of COVID. Um, it was a lunchtime meeting. We did a large room with social distancing, but we also gave people a virtual option. Um, the meetings are run by our elected prosecutor. She's the main facilitator. We share data. We've been doing um, um, a lot of data analysis, particularly on drug prosecutions, because we're thinking about a big policy change there. Um, we give hypotheticals of actual cases sometimes to ask what questions that, um, that we should be asking. Um, we have four meetings a year plus an orientation. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick example of drugs was our major, is like our major policy conversation right now. So we, at the first meeting, we gave a preview of drugs. We asked the community board, what do you wanna know about drug enforcement? So they gave a, we have a crime analyst and the crime analyst was going to um, pull the data and analyze the data. So, um, so we asked the community board members what data they wanted to hear. And then um, we pulled and did a, a major uh, dive into our drug prosecutions, um, presented that to the board. Um, this, is, this is the presentation of what we presented them. Um, and then talked about policy changes, in, in, including um, racial demographics. So we have some really difficult, good conversations with this group. Um, it is, you know, it, it, it's not a time to make ourselves look good. It's not a time to, um, I'm gonna go down really quick here. We want, we, we want to have um, the difficult conversations. On drugs, we're looking, just quickly, we're looking at charging cases that have a, a nexus to violence or a community concern. So it's particularly interesting to ask the community, um, because all these people live or work in these areas, tell us what types of drug use or drug sales um, do you care about? Or, or care about enough to, you know, prosecute people through the criminal justice system, I should say. I think, you know, they care about all drug use, but, but which cases um, are worthy of, of, um, of prosecution. So I, I, I'll just close in saying um, that this, you know, it's, it's a difficult time for, um, for people in, in law enforcement and, and prosecution, but an exciting time because of all the possible reforms. Um, and this has been the community, like assembling this community advisory board and meeting with them has been like certainly one of the most fulfilling and productive things that our office has done in the last year. Um, you know, we're in, like you, we're entrenched in, in different battles, the battle um, against gun violence. Like I said, we have a deteriorating relationship with our police, the community advisory board, and they say difficult things to us, but it's the one place during this time where we gather and we actually feel like we're addressing big questions head on and coming up with, um, with productive solutions. So um, that's all I have. Okay, we have a, a few more questions. One is whether your advisory board members are paid in any way or they're all volunteer. It's all volunteer. And the second question is, um, 
you did ask them questions about your drug policy. Did you ask them for recommendations about what your policy should be? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Or, or we knew that we wanted to charge cases that were of community concern. So we asked them in a policy, you know, what is community concern? Tell us, <clears throat> these are neighborhood association presidents. So they're familiar with calling the police to report a drug dealer. Like, um, explain for us you know, the cases we should be charging. 